Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Dylan Taylor, who is the chairman and CEO of Voyager Space and a space traveler yourself. <laughs> True. I actually, um, well, we'll get to that. Let's start with Voyager. What, what do you do? Sure. Voyager is a space infrastructure company. So if you think that we now have sort of built the gateway to space with reliable, reusable, inexpensive launch, mm -hmm. the next phase is building infrastructure in space. Like so the space station, basically. Indeed. Yeah, and Voyager Space is working on building the replacement to the International Space Station. So one of the challenges when you talk about space, it's very cool on the one hand. And then the question is, where are we going to make the money? Sure. So what do you see as the business model for space entrepreneurship. Talk about it in the context first of what you're doing. Ones and zeros is a short answer. So now that we can get hardware into space, uh, we can build more constellations. More constellations means more data collection. More data collection means more insight. About what, kind of, what kind of data? Could be anything. Let's say global logistics. Um, let's say you're shipping something from Hong Kong to London uh, and you know, AI knows, it's going to be uh, plugged at the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. And it knows that because it has perfect information about the So it's like world. satellite technology yeah. back down, sort of basically understanding Earth better, which is why everybody gets both excited and perplexed when they hear about Starlink and sort of the right. critical mass there. What, can you talk a little bit about the origin story of Voyager itself? Sure. Yeah. You know, I'm sure it had sort of a scientific you know, backdrop in terms of how you commercialized it in the first place. Yeah, actually a little bit more of a finance bet, actually. The, the whole idea was new space is real. The technology is starting to mature. Um, you have the aerospace primes, kind of the big old guard, and you have the up upstarts. Uh, the upstarts are real, however, they're not scaling particularly w well. What, what do you mean by upstarts? Tell me, like, what category would you put in the upstarts it, category? It could be anything. It could be new, smaller satellites, new launch technology, Gamification all of, of space, all these things we get. Everything. Yeah. But what wasn't happening, uh, they're founder-led, founders are, are geniuses, uh, however, they're not used to running a business at scale. So the whole thesis with Voyager is, can you be the best of both worlds? Mm -hmm. Can you scale new space, build a mini prime contractor, mm -hmm. but yet be more innovative and flexible than the big uh, aerospace primes? There's four of them. Uh, more flexible and adaptable than, than So So you're in that middle ground. And so what you think what differentiates you from the big guys? Let's start with that. Because they have the scale. Yeah. They have the expertise in finance. Do they lack nimbleness? What is it that you bring to the table? Uh, they don't lack much. They're very capable, but they're, um, they're not terribly innovative, and they're not terribly flexible with their solutions, and they're typically order takers as opposed to solution providers. And so that's, that's really where they lack uh, capability. How do you, when you build infrastructure and in space, it always seems very um, capital intensive, first of all. And, you know, I'm Canadian. I know there's always a lot of attention on that space arm right. that Canada contributes. So there's, uh, how do you actually build a business in this area? I mean, can you talk more about what Voyager did to, in essence, get on that playing field? Sure. So um, our insight was that the uh, International Space Station was going to be privatized. It was going to be replaced by a commercial space station. So the idea would be, how do you win that NASA contract? And the idea was, if you can assemble capability and be, uh, in addition to capable, a safe pair of hands, mm -hmm. NASA would select you. And that's what happened. So 20 months after our founding, we won. We were one of three providers to win the replacement contract to build the International Space Station replacement. Talk a bit about your own background, how you came to this. Sure, lifelong space nut. Um, didn't get into space full time until about 2016, 17 or so. What were you doing prior to that? I was running public companies. Mm -hmm. So running companies at scale um, in electronics, banking, finance, real estate, all different kinds of industries. Uh, typically global businesses, uh, typically 10,000 employees or more and publicly traded. But my first passion was always space. So I wanted to come into the industry full time. And you've been to space. I have. So um, I have. and talk about that. How did you get to space? It, well, it's a life-changing moment. So I did a suborbital flight on Blue Origin. That's mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos's company, and I was uh, I flew in December of 21. They had a journalist on board, Michael Strahan, mm -hmm. who you might know, mm -hmm. host of Good Morning America. So I was on that flight. Uh, so I paid to go, uh, but I had founded a nonprofit called Space for Humanity, mm -hmm. which was looking to democratize access to space. 
And so I think I was able to go on an early flight because I think they perceived that I'd be able to talk about the power of space to transform and how important space is to democratize. Uh, so yeah, it was what a gift, amazing experience. Can you just let us see it a little bit through your eyes? You know, when you got up there, I mean, obviously we've seen movies and it's like, oh, right. there's the earth. But right. any, what were you surprised by about the experience? I had very high expectations, even though I told myself not to, and it was a thousand X better than I could have even hoped. Um, it's something that you can't unsee. Um, it's a vividness that just penetrates you down to your core. And then it's almost like a new emotion. Uh, it's a, a bit awe, it's a bit love, it's a bit affection, but it's also a bit of terror, you know, because you realize how fragile we're, uh, state we're in and how vulnerable we are, and a little bit of anger, because it's like, why don't people understand you know, the truth of mm -hmm. things? So if you think about all those emotions fused together, penetrating you to where you can't unfeel it, it's permanent inside of you, that's, that's a bit what it's like. Does it change how you, um, how you are as a leader? I mean, obviously you're now in this space, in space, you know, you're already in the industry. Yeah. How does it change your mindset there? Greater sense of urgency that we have to build more infrastructure, get more people out there. And so, you know, imagine like a UN Security Council meeting on a space station in space. I think it would be a different outcome if world leaders were able to have that perspective. I really believe that. It would be more cohesive. It'd be more cohesive and I think, you know, part of our challenge, um, we have these problems that seem intractable and we think to ourselves, well, we haven't found the right solution. Well, it could be we, we haven't had the right perspective. Yeah, right? that's fair. We're being fair. too parochial too narrow-minded and we're not identifying at a high enough level. Can you walk us through a little bit, um, not just the cost, but I, I really am curious about how you, let's say you privatize the space station, um, you're up there, you're building, do you transport stuff up there? I mean, you must be a lot of 3D printing. I mean, what is yeah. the technology that you need to get the next generation space station right. for Earth? Well, it should be optimized for use. So the International Space Station, one of the best things humans have done. Canada's been a big part, uh, other nations. But it's old, you know, it's like. It's old and it was never, it was a hodgepodge. It was assembled over time. It was never master planned from the beginning. So you might have a thin film microgravity experiment next to an astronaut on a treadmill, right? That's not ideal. Our space station is called Starlab. It'll fly in 2028. It's optimized for research purposes. How big is it? Give us a sense of the scale of Starlab. It is about a third of the volume of the International Space Station, which is roughly two-thirds of the volume of a 747 if you were to completely empty it of seats. And do you have to bring everything basically through rockets? I mean, is there anything that you're, anything you can do more efficiently and differently than the, the first generation of people who built? For sure. You uh, alluded to space manufacturing. So, um, you know, imagine rather than sending all the tools, imagine a machine where you can 3D print the tool that you need. And after that, you turn it into a slurry so you can print something else, right? That technology exists. So that's one example. It feels very remote, literally, to most people and also to most business people that yeah. that sounds nice, but I don't care. It's not relevant to what I do. Right. Is that going to change? I think so. We go to space to benefit Earth. Uh, every business plan, probably from Silicon Valley in the last 20 years, uses the GPS constellation. We can't live without our cell phones, right, which are enabled by satellite technology. Climate change, you know, people say, well, the rockets are, are creating carbon. Yes, but where's our climate data coming from? It's coming from these uh, high tech satellites that we put in so orbit. One question, Dylan, I have is, you know, when you talk about democratizing space, mm. Should we be concerned if we're seeing monopolies emerge in those technologies? Yes. Yes, I think monopolies in general are bad for everybody, except for the monopolist. And, and how do we mm. defeat it when, when there's so much, um, you know, so much of the investments coming from relatively few hands, at least yeah. in terms of what gets press? I think we need to uh, enforce antitrust rules and uh, bring has, those back. Has there been any antitrust attention to space? Not that I'm aware of, but I, I have to imagine that somewhere in some room somewhere people are talking about it. You've been a leader of public companies. Mm -hmm. um, now you're in a startup. We're also not seeing many companies that want to go public, yeah. and you have firsthand experience. Yeah. Does it make sense to you, or do you think we're missing something? We're, we're on a path, actually. Um, we resisted the SPAC urge, even though we were getting maybe a call Should a I week. Should I congratulate you? Yes, I think congratulations. It, sometimes your best decisions are what you choose not to do. Right. Um, but we would like to do a traditional S1 public offering 
We think our industry deserves that. Um, the last one was actually a Canadian company, MDA, uh, that listed on the TSX. Why is it important to be a public company when you say that the industry deserves it? Well, I think um, leadership to show how a well-run uh, company, new space company at scale, can, uh, can flourish. Since you're private, you don't have to tell me, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, at what point do you become profitable? We are profitable today um, mm -hmm. at the operating company level. If you take all our holding company costs, which are in preparation of doing things like going public, um, we're running a little bit negative, but at the operating level, we're already profitable. So since you're in a, I think of space, I think of visionaries, I think you've been addicted to space. I've loved it since mm -hmm. I was a kid. Give us a sense of the vision of what's possible. I don't know if it's five year horizon, 10, you tell me, but what in an ideal world could this look like? Sure. Both from a business ecosystem and how it changes life on right. earth. Well, I think perspective is one, right? If we get more people up there, if we understand that we are, it's a miracle that we have here on earth and that we need to sort of diversify. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think Elon makes the argument diversify consciousness. I'm not quite in that camp, but he's got a point. But imagine sitting on your porch at night, you're looking up at the moon and you see lights on the moon. And you see lights on the moon because we built a moon Condo. base up there. <laughs> Condo, yeah, metaphorical. Um, but we have technology now to mine uh, moon soil to create oxygen. So we can literally you know, take the water filter instead of taking all the, uh, you know, the, the water with us, so to speak. So I think that's uh, interesting. So we'll have infrastructure on the moon. We'll have uh, probably three or four commercial space stations. Mm -hmm. And then once we have that beachhead, you know, think of us as sort of the fish flopping onto the beach, you know, the first mammal, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, uh, you know, progenerators, I guess. Think of us at that stage. Once, once we have the beachhead, then we can go further into space, okay. uh, places like Mars and elsewhere. One last question, unless you have something to put on our radar, is so much of the original sort of space race was mm. country v. country, right? Russia right. against the U.S. And people have talked about the need for almost a space policy. We're now seeing the private sector move ahead of the NASA's of the world and such. What do you think about that? How, what's the right way to be contemplating the competitive environment around space? Yeah, well, NASA is very much a leader in this. Right. They're our biggest client. Um, but unfortunately, it is still a rivalistic industry. Um, we have China. China has a space station. Should we be concerned about China having a space station? Yes. In Why? My, in my opinion, because I think uh, the interests of the Western democracies are not going to be represented on that space station. Um, so I see two different ecosystems. You know, think Apple and Android. Yep. Um, one Chinese-led with a handful of countries following China, and one U.S.-led uh, with many, many, many countries uh, following the U.S. There, there's something called the Artemis Accords, yep. created by Jim Bridenstine, uh, previous NASA administrator. 21 countries have signed that. That's a good start. So it'll be a bipolar world in space. I opinion. think it is, and it will be increasingly so. That's what I see. Great. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Hope to get to space myself. Thanks yes. for joining us, Dylan. Thank you.